that. Um, just thank you to all the speakers for um, just sharing so much. As Jasmine said, you are all amazing, and I'm I'm uh, very humbled to hear your stories and all you've accomplished. Um, so I think we're all here tonight because we share the belief that everyone deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. And too many folks in Washington County, in Oregon, and throughout the country are struggling to make that a reality right now. Um, but we know that working together, we can help others, including our elected leaders, understand better what's happening in our communities and how we can work together toward better solutions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so uh, we're, tonight we'll, we'll have a, a few areas of focus. Um, it, the main one will be on what we call regulated affordable housing. Um, this is mostly rental housing, and uh, we refer to it as regulated because there are restrictions placed on it by the entities providing funding. And these are mostly um, uh, federal and state and sometimes local governments. Um, also, we wanted to spend some of our time tonight to build a base with some of the key terms and players that impact um, housing affordability in our area. Um, both Washington County and the larger Portland, Portland metro area. So we'll cover some definitions, some terms, some key players, and more. And the next slide, please. So um, just briefly, we wanted to define affordable housing. Um, and generally, what we mean by that is that your home is affordable to you if your rent or mortgage, along with utilities, doesn't take more than 30% of your gross monthly income for your household. Um, so if you take a moment to consider this definition um, and whether your current housing costs fall within, within that definition, um, and if not, you're part of a very large group of folks in Washington County, over 50,000 people. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. And the next slide, please. So some, uh, some key terms, um, as we talked about a little bit, um, there are kind of two types of affordable housing some that's regulated and some in the private market that happens to be affordable at the moment, but is unregulated over the long term. And um, while the bulk of all our housing in the US is unregulated, the government does play a role and has developed um, several programs to try and assist those who need help with housing costs and um, are low, have incomes that are, are lower than the median. Um, there are government programs that provide money to builders or what we call developers is the term um, that we use in, in housing. Um, and these are folks that want to build and usually own and operate regulated affordable housing. Um, and these types of housing include public housing uh, or these types of funding rather include public housing, tax credits and bonds. Um, other programs provide assistance directly to tenants to pay a portion of their rent. Um, these would include some things like Section 8 vouchers or state and local rental assistance funds. And um, some of you may be aware that during the pandemic, um, a lot of uh, new rent assistance became available and was administered by uh, local nonprofits, um, uh, agencies like Community Action and others. So all of these types of assistance, um, Section 8, rent assistance, other types of funding, comes with strings or restrictions. And this is often um, on the income levels being served or the period of time the home must remain affordable. Um, so uh, in talking about unregulated or private market affordable housing, um, some people call this type of housing, uh, um, well, there are different acronyms, but one of the ones that we use is uh, LICMR, 
<laughs> which does not roll easily off the tongue, but um, that's low cost market rental. Um, and it's kind of a good description of that kind of unregulated housing. It just happens to be low cost and it's on the open rental market. Um, this type of unregulated housing can be really precarious. Um, the term or acronym um, hot mess, <laughs> which is another funny one, um, is often actually a good description of, of that type of housing because sometimes it's great, but sometimes it's in disrepair. Sometimes there's poor management and other problems and there's no redress for these problems because no program is regulating it. And when any number of things happen with these types of unregulated properties, they change hands or the neighborhood changes, rents increase, um, tenants may have to move and lose their homes. Um, and so that's another disadvantage of unregulated housing. The next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the key terms um, you'll hear when we're talking about um, housing and affordable housing in particular. Um, so many people you may have heard talk about public housing. Um, this is housing that's owned by local housing authorities. Um, and it's a really a very small part of the affordable housing picture in Washington County. Um, less than 250 homes in the county are in this category. Um, what a lot of people may be referring to when they say something like public housing or use that term um, is other uh, regulated affordable housing or low income housing. Um, and those uh, types of properties could be funded by tax credits. Um, they could be funded directly by HUD, which is the federal agency that controls funding and, and regulation for housing in the United States. Um, and these are developed um, by private developers and nonprofits. Um, and there are about 8,000 of these types of homes um, in Washington County currently. So over the past 20 or 30 years, um, federal government policy has moved away from public housing, um, and they're really moving toward funding for private owners to build housing, um, like I was just mentioning with tax credits or um, with HUD programs, um, and then also rental assistance and vouchers that go directly to tenants or folks seeking housing. So um, the Housing Authority of Washington County um, provides about 3,000 vouchers, um, Section 8 vouchers, to low-income households and um, other entities like nonprofits or jurisdictions like cities um, to provide rental assistance. Um, and then zoning and land use is uh, another term you might have heard, and it's been um, in the news a lot recently. Uh, especially because there was a, a bill uh, passed in Oregon, um, the first of its type in the country that um, uh, changed zoning laws throughout the state. Um, so uh, local zoning and land use requirements guide what can be built in a given community. So in the past, um, uh, cities or the county or a county in Oregon might have zoned, for instance, um, for large lots that you could only build a single family home on that very large lot, for instance. Um, and these types of actions have historically led to racial disparities with less, less access to housing for communities of color. But now with that measure that I just mentioned, it was House Bill 2001, um, the state of Oregon has asked local governments to allow for what folks who work in housing call infill, or um, you might have heard the term missing middle housing. And um, this would be duplexes, four to six plexes, so basically small um, apartment buildings, and um, things like accessory dwelling units or ADUs and some other housing types, um, cottage clusters and others. Um, and this aims, aims to add more choices by size and price range 
So on a large piece of land, rather than just having the option to build one single family home, you might have the option to build four homes, um, which is you know, a much better use of, of that piece of land in that case um, for density and housing choices. And the next slide, please. Uh, so some other key terms, um, you may have heard the term gentrification. In fact, there's a Netflix show called Hentified about uh, Mexican immigrant families in LA trying to hold on to their homes and businesses as the neighborhood around them gentrifies. Um, displacement is another term, um, and that's typically used to indicate that someone has lost their home and not by choice. Um, so whether you say a neighborhood was gentrified or someone was displaced, um, the meaning is similar. Um, and that is that 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 person or that family was priced out or moved because of increased rents, uh, redevelopment in the area or other changes that come with gentrification and displacement. Um, so some economists, uh, when they're talking about housing, really believe in a concept called filtering. Um, basically, it means if we can build enough new housing, the older buildings will filter down and become affordable. And although there's some evidence um, for this theory working in practice, it doesn't always work. And um, often it doesn't work at all for certain groups, um, particularly very low income folks, like folks who live on fixed fixed incomes like seniors and uh, uh, people on disability, um, those kinds of groups. Um, sometimes older homes become actually the most expensive and sometimes there's so much demand uh, and, and so little inventory that there's no chance for the units to filter down. And that's the situation we're in now in the Portland metro area. Um, plus sometimes older buildings are in poor repair and are affordable only because they are unsafe or undesirable. Um, another term you might have heard is uh, permanent supportive housing or PSH. Um, and uh, that's, you've probably heard more about that since Metro passed the supporting housing, ha supportive housing services measure to try to address houselessness. Um, this combines housing assistance with support services, which the residents voluntarily agree to participate in. And it's aimed at helping particularly vulnerable people, such as chronically houseless individuals or those with disabilities, um, serious mental illness, and so forth, move into and be successful in permanent housing. And the next slide, please. Um, so uh, some other um, terms and, and just a little more about funding sources, um, how we're paying for affordable housing to be built. Um, so some of these sources you'll hear are um, LIHTC or also sometimes called, called tax credits, 9% um, credits. Um, and this is a federal program. Um, so state, the, the money comes from the federal government but states set their own policies about how the funds will be allocated um, and they make awards on a competitive basis. So to get this type of funding, you as a developer would fill out a complex application at the state level and they would compare it to other applicants um, to see if they would fund your project. There are also bonds. Um, and the best example of that for us here is the recent Metro Affordable Housing Bond. Um, and, uh, and then the Local Innovation and Fast Track Program, which is also a bond program. Um, and these are the two biggest bond sources in Western Oregon. Um, and they've both been really successful in um, generating building of a lot of affordable housing. There's the HOME program. So this is, uh, these are again funds that come directly from the federal government, from HUD, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. 
uh, they pass these funds through to local jurisdictions. So Washington County is a home jurisdiction. And again, these are funds that are awarded on a competitive basis through a complex application program. Um, it can be used for building multifamily or single family housing. Currently in Washington County, they're only used for multifamily housing. Um, also CDBG is a, is a big um, program that we talk about. Um, again, this is a pass through from HUD, um, but this program rather than building housing directly is more oriented um, at, uh, for services and also infrastructure surrounding housing like streets, sidewalks, um, street lights, um, uh, intersection control like uh, uh, crosswalks and, and, and walk lights. Um, and it can also be used for rehab of single family homes. Um, although again, um, that is a use that we don't see that often in Washington County. Um, there are a few other HUD programs. Um, they're, they're not used as much, um, but you, you might hear or see them um, talked about sometimes, such as HUD 811 um, is a program you might hear about. Um, it, basically, these programs have, have not been used recently. Um, there are existing homes that were developed with these programs, um, but they no longer have funding through them. And when they need renovation or support, um, the, the owner operators will go to program, the other programs like LIHTC um, to get funding for these homes. And the next slide, please. So um, key government players, as we were talking about, um, so obviously the federal government, um, that's Department of Housing and Urban Development or HUD, and that's the federal agency that administers all housing funds and um, regulations for housing um, in the United States. Um, the state, um, all states have something called a state housing finance agency and Oregon's agency is called OHCS or Oregon Housing and Community Services. Um, and then the county. Um, so in Washington County, we have the Housing Authority of Washington County, the Department of Housing Services, which is um, related to and works with, but is separate from the Housing Authority. And then the Office of Community Development that works in development separate from housing. So um, OCD in Washington County administers home funds and CDBG, among other things. Um, there are also certain cities that are active in funding affordable housing. Um, they have standalone programs that provide funding, and then some that partner on individual affordable housing projects. So for example, the city of Beaverton often provides grant funds to projects as they're doing the early work to get ready to start building, start construction of the project. Um, that's what we call pre-development work. And um, also the city of Tigard um, has done a lot of things to encourage the building of affordable housing within, their, within the city. Um, and right now um, they're actually developing a fund um, for uh, developers building um, missing middle housing that we talked about a little earlier. Um, and these are again, smaller units and smaller developments often built on single family lots. Um, and then uh, a Metro is another um, key government source. Um, you know, it's a, we Metro is a bit of an unusual uh, uh, government entity, and since it's a regional government, not all states have that. Um, and of course, this is where the Metro bond came from, um, which benefit, benefited Washington, Clackamas, and Multnomah counties, and that's the Metro region. Next slide, please. And so this is kind of just a, a list, um, some examples of folks that are doing the work of um, building affordable housing, providing uh, services, and also lending funds in the metro region. And um, all of the developers listed here build regulated affordable housing almost exclusively. 
Um, and many of these got funding from the Metro Bond to build in Washington County. You can see there's a mix of nonprofits and for-profits. Um, there, and this is just a small list. Um, and particularly for service providers, there are many, many service providers that work in Washington County and in the metro region. Um, and the lenders um, that we listed here are CDFIs, like Community Housing Fund. Um, there are, though, banks, commercial banks and credit unions um, that do work with um, developers to uh, fund building of affordable housing. They will usually come in at funding at uh, during construction or for permanent loans. Um, CHF works almost exclusively in the early stage of funding. So we will fund in what's called the pre-development period or for acquisition as um, developers are acquiring land to build a project. And the next slide, please. Um, so uh, we're not gonna uh, talk too much about home ownership tonight, um, but we did wanna give you an idea of who some of the players are in affordable home ownership in Washington County. Um, so you may have heard of Habitat for Humanity. There are two um, Habitat affiliates in Washington County, West Tuolity Habitat that works in Forest Grove and Cornelius and points west of that. And then um, Habitat for Humanity Portland Region. Um, they work in Hillsborough, Beaverton and points east into Portland. Um, they are currently building homes in Forest Grove, Hillsborough, Beaverton, and King City between the two affiliates. Um, and just so that um, it's clear their name is a little confusing, but Portland Region Habitat is the result of a merger between two smaller affiliates. Um, so there used to be a Portland Habitat and a, a Habitat operating in Hillsborough. Um, and they're still uh, working out, um, they're getting to know their new territory um, as a result of the merger. So we really expect to see them um, ramping up their development in Washington County within the next few years. Um, another organization is Proud Ground. Um, it is a, land, a community land trust. And that means that when someone um, buys a home with the assistance of Proud Ground, they provide subsidy for folks buying homes as well as other types of support. Um, that home uh, goes into uh, this commonly held land um, and the home is then permanently affordable. So the person that owns it may sell it and buy another home. The person who buys that home um, would also have to be income qualified. Um, so that's, that's the real advantage of a land trust. Um, and folks with, that work within this model um, uh, in, in exchange for the subsidy and the services that Proud Ground provides for them, they sacrifice a, um, a portion of their housing equity. So when they sell their home, um, a certain percentage of that sale goes to Proud Ground and that maintains the affordability for all of the homes in that model. Um, and uh, then um, there are assistance centers and, and uh, folks who just provide different kinds of services, um, sometimes funding and mortgage products. Um, and one of the, the big ones in the Portland area is the Portland Housing Center. Um, they operate in Washington and Multnomah counties. And um, they're kind of, a, I like to refer to them as kind of a one-stop shop um, for uh, home buyers. Um, they provide services like home buyer education, um, other services like financial planning and credit counseling. Um, and they have information about available assistance like down payment assistance, loans or grants. Um, and other funding. So they're a really great source. And the next slide, please. Uh, I saw a note on oh, the chat. Sorry, I used it. Jasmine. Yes. So um, 
no interpretation on uh, Spanish channel, I I guess. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, no sé quién está interpretando, pero dicen que no escuchan. In interpreters? ¿Quién está interpretando en ese momento? Todo bien. Great, thanks you guys. Thanks for letting us know there was a problem. Yes. And uh, um, I think, Pee, can we go to the next slide? Um, and this is just a, um, yeah, these are some examples of uh, some homes that were built by Habitat for Humanity. And you can also see um, the large group of um, uh, home buyers and volunteers um, that that build these um, homes. Uh, they have a unique model where um, folks participating with Habitat work on their own and uh, their neighbors' homes in the development. Um, it's a model called self-help. And um, also, Habitats uh, utilize large groups of volunteers to do their building. Um, so you can see that here. And the next slide, please, Pee-wee. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is a big question. Um, how affordable is housing in Washington County? So it's not a surprise to anyone to say there's not enough housing. Um, our population is growing far faster than um, what we call housing starts or new homes um, uh, being started in construction. And it's difficult to... Excuse me. Um, so there's no interpretation again. Sorry to interrupt. Estoy escuchando a los dos ahora a la mujer y al um, a, um, al señor los dos interpretando. Sí. Se escuchan los dos al mismo tiempo, por eso no se escucha muy bien, claro. Hmm. I see uh, both Felicity and Paul in, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so now both of you are in Spanish channel. Should I, um, uh, should we continue? I assume silence means yes. All right, okay. Okay, thank you. Um. So yeah, um, as we were just saying, you know, there's not enough housing. Um, we're, there was a lack before the, the pandemic and then um, it just, the, the lack of housing, the lack of inventory just got worse. Um, a lot of people moved to Oregon um, and that increased during the pandemic. Um, it also just costs too much. Um, so on, on, on top of there being scarcity of housing, um, the housing costs are just increasing far faster than wages. Um, there's an estimate of more than 50,000 cost burdened um, households, meaning folks paying more than 30% of their income in housing uh, costs. And there are many severely cost burdened, which means they're paying 50% or more of their income. Um, and the shortages of housing and affordable housing are, of course, the worst um, for folks with the lowest income levels. Um, so every five years, um, Washington County and the cities of Beaverton and Hillsborough produce a joint planning document called the Consolidated, Pl Consolidated Plan, excuse me. Um, and this provides a summary of the housing market in our counties 
unmet needs and our housing and community development priorities um, within the county and the cities. Um, it's, so it's really helpful to tie specific comments to this plan as it's used by local governments as their roadmap um, for housing policy. And so CHF and other affordable housing advocates um, uh, uh, participate as much as they can in this process whenever possible. Um, and Washington County has been generous with CHF and has allowed us to sit at this table um, basically the entire time we've existed for about 20 years. Um, so we're, we're involved in this process each time it happens. Um, so in the most recent consolidated plan that goes from 2020 to 2024, um, there, the notes included the fact that the population is growing much faster, uh, with, which leaves us without the homes that we need. Um, and, uh, you know, these resulting things that we're talking about. Um, another um, another uh, note on the plan is that um, there are about 12,000, uh, lack of about 12,000 homes for um, those earning less than $25,000 per year. Um, and um, unfortunately, the timing of the 2020 to 2024 con plan was particularly unfortunate because the pandemic changed a lot of things. So um, those numbers in the, the con plan have gotten much worse um, and increased uh, very much um, in, in the ensuing about three years. Um, so we expect the new version of the con plan to uh, have a big change from the last one. And the next slide, please. So um, this, this slide is basically just talking about who qualifies for um, housing assistance. Um, so most affordable housing programs are targeted at folks um, at or below 60% of area median income. And that's a, a measurement um, that's produced by HUD on an annual basis. Um, in Washington County, that's about 40,000 a year for a one person household or up to about 58,000 a year for a household of four, <laughs> excuse me. And those measurements um, do go up for, their, for larger households, but that just gives you an idea of kind of a typical range. Um, we also produce housing for much lower income folks, um, like we were talking about a little bit ago. Um, for instance, seniors on uh, social security, um, folks that are on disability, or um, uh, people that are needing permanent supportive housing, um, folks who have um, serious disabilities are uh, formerly homeless and so forth. So that range um, is about $22,000 to $31,000 a year um, for households of one to four, gives you kind of an idea of that range. And then the maximum for most programs that are, um, are funding or building um, affordable housing is 80% AMI. Um, and uh, most programs will not go above that amount. Um, and that's, you can see that range there, uh, about 59,000 to 85,000 um, a year for households from one to four people. Um, unfortunately, only about one in four folks who qualify for housing assistance, um, like Section 8 vouchers or rental assistance actually apply for and receive it. Um, there is a lack. Uh, there are, are not enough vouchers for the number of people who would qualify for them in the county. Um, and during the pandemic, uh, rental assistance increased greatly, but there is still a great need um, for rental assistance. Um, so there, there's not enough assistance there for people who need it. Um, and uh, there are a lot of organizations that are advocating at the state level to increase um, rent assistance for the state um, and get more assistance coming to folks who need it. Um, and also uh, time on wait lists for uh, things like rental assistance for public housing or for individual affordable units. So 
um, folks who own and operate affordable housing, um, those housing uh, um, projects, properties are generally full and um, have can have sometimes long wait lists. So um, the wait is about one to three years, unfortunately, at this point, which um, we, we work with a lot of folks who are trying to uh, decrease that number because that's unacceptable to have to wait that long for assistance and for affordable housing. And wait times have really increased over the past few years, as you would expect, due to the increased need coming out of the pandemic. And the next slide, please. So this is a kind of technical, but um, we just wanted to kind of show you the difference um, between how um, kind of uh, typical or market rate housing, um, even multifamily housing is funded and financed and how affordable regulated housing is financed. Um, I, you may have heard some talk in the media about affordable housing being so expensive and why is that? And you know, there's, um, there's a lot of head shaking about that. Um, we know exactly why it is. Um, and the, the biggest difference is that um, for regulated housing, um, there isn't the expectation of a profit um, these owner operators are providing housing at below market rents. And so often there's little to no profit happening. And therefore, these projects are not attractive to um, most banks, especially in the early stages of the project. So while a developer in the private market, kind of just the traditional um, uh, market, could just go to a bank and put 20% down and get a loan and build the project and then easily pay it back from you know, the rents or the, um, the purchase prices that they're getting. That's just not as much of a possibility for developers of affordable housing. Um, so rather than that one source um, that a typical uh, developer in the open market would need, uh, regulated affordable housing developers um, need anywhere from five to 15 sources of funding. And um, I can tell you that I personally have seen the projects with 15 sources of funding. Um, so it, it really does happen. Um, and, uh, um, you know, these, these owner operators just can't afford to make a large loan payment every month. Um, and uh, they can't afford to have debt in their properties. So they really are depending on subsidy from uh, federal, state, and local uh, entities. Um, so the biggest source of, of equity of funding for um, regulated affordable housing is LIHTC, like we talked about before. That's the federal program that provides tax credits um, and the, the um, Working of LIHTC is somewhat complex, um, but um, it is a system that, that works well for a lot of affordable housing. Um, there are other grants, um, including the local grants that we talked about, uh, HOME and others. Um, and these sources for affordable housing are highly competitive. Um, they're limited and they often take several years to bring together. So um, three to five years for affordable housing projects from kind of the idea, the, the first um, work that they do on the project to completion is not unusual. And that's much longer than most market rate um, projects take to build. Um, yeah, so in short, um, we've never produced the amount of affordable housing we've needed because there just isn't enough equity or grant sources. In the next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, how can we build more with this shortage? Well, the Metro Affordable Housing Bond um, was a real game changer for um, the whole metro region, but certainly for, for Washington County. Um, it made a huge difference. Um, it was the first of its kind in the nation um, it covered a region, a three county region, rather than just a, a city or a single county. And um, for Washington County, the bond is providing enough funding 
for about 1,300 homes, which given the numbers we were talking about before, doesn't sound like a lot, but um, that's a huge increase over the amount of funding, uh, the amount of homes that we had funding to build um, prior to the bond. Um, and that's enormously more than we could otherwise produce without the bond funding. Um, and then, you know, Metro's been combined with other funding sources at the state and local level, and cities have um, pitched in and nonprofits. And so there's been a lot of, uh, of uh, leveraging of, of those sources, which has been really great to see. And since the bond has been so successful, we really hope that there'll be another similar funding measure from Metro or another source for the region um, in the near future. And we're actively working with our um, uh, partners and our colleagues in affordable housing to advocate for that. And the next slide, please. Yeah, so just a little bit about um, the Metro Bond, other than the great funding it provided. Um, it's really changed some things because it's, a, it's pushed developers and lenders and service providers um, to address structural racism in a much more substantive way than was happening before. Um, so developers are asked to engage and make decisions about the location and design of housing with the community where the housing will be located and with the folks that the housing is intended to serve. Um, so that's no longer happening in a vacuum, which is a huge change. Um, one of the ways that this is happening for developers is that they're creating um, advisory committees or advisory groups that are meeting with architects and are meeting with the, the um, general contractors who are building the buildings along with the, the developers who are gonna own and operate the building. And they're really talking about, you know, what do you need? What is gonna serve you and your community and what are you, you know, looking for? Um, what's going to be best in this situation? And it's actually changing the design of the building or the design of the site of the property. So um, it's real tangible change. And um, it, it, that's been a real difference that we've seen. Um, and Metro um, is requiring um, developers to set measurable goals related to this engagement and also about how they're gonna deliver the homes. And the next slide, please. And uh, the, other, um, the other thing that uh, the Metro Bond is, is um, requiring is that we increase access to affordable housing, affordable rental housing. Um, and they've made a set of outreach and screening recommendations. Um, so this would be like the, the way that um, uh, landlords or, or you know, uh, rental housing owner operators are engaging with folks who are looking for housing. Um, so if uh, a property got funding from the Metro bond, um, the owner operators have to be more open about their outreach and screening criteria. So it's no longer secret what they're looking for. They have to tell everyone. Um, and they're also encouraged to make their screening criteria um, what's often called low barrier. So you can see some of the examples here, um, considering, you know, different credit scores or um, alternative forms of identification, um, uh, Alter, you know, alternative consideration um, in background checks and uh, criminal history and things like that. Um, and what we really hope is that um, these uh, changes, which are becoming standard for owner operators now, you know, as as people had to start adopting them for the Metro Bond, then everyone started adopting them, which is great. Um, and we really hope that um, these changes are going to allow those who need the housing the most a greater opportunity to access it. Um, 
And uh, most of the projects in the Metro Bond have some project page vouchers. And so they can also make uh, units available to folks who are formerly houseless or those very low income households um, at or around 30% AMI we were talking about before. And the next slide, please. Um, there are also requirements on location. So um, developers are asked to intentionally locate housing in what is sometimes called high opportunity communities um, and, and make clear that people of color are welcome in, um, in these communities. And um, high opportunity meaning there's a great access to transit. There are a lot of employment opportunities. There's a lot of retail. Um, there are other um, opportunities to engage with the community. Um, so, you know, vibrant places. Um, and then op developers are also asked to consider locations where people of color already live um, and uh, to prevent displacement and improve conditions there. And then finally, they're asked to locate in neighborhoods, as you're we talking about, with access to jobs and access to transit, um, and that are really desirable places to live. And the next slide, please. And um, another change uh, has to do with um, how these projects are being built. So one of the most critical requirements is that developers and contractors intentionally hire minority and women-owned firms to um, design and construct and do all of the jobs around um, building the, this housing. Um, they need to set goals for apprenticeship program participation um, and workforce force diversity, and they're, they're held to strict account to meet those goals. Um, and they're asked to create additional capacity in construction trades for women and minorities. Um, so helping um, folks with businesses um, build their capacity for small businesses and so forth. Um, and finally, they're asked to support the community by creating living wage jobs. And that's both during construction and with ongoing operations. So this is a, a requirement for both the um, general contractor who's building the, the um, project and for the owner operator who's gonna operate it in the long term. And the next slide, please. And so uh, the last few slides are just a, a few beauty shots that we wanted to share of um, affordable housing um, properties in Washington County. Um, and uh, a few of these, this one in particular, the Marianne happens to be um, a Metro Bond project. Um, it was actually the first Metro Bond project um, completed in the county. Um, as you can see, it's in Beaverton. And um, this, like all of the projects, um, we're just really proud of how beautiful they are and that they've been you know, really successful for their residents. And these are all projects that um, CHF has provided funding for as well in the early stages of the project. And um, you just wanna, yeah, go through the other slides. Um, these are just uh, additional projects uh, uh, around the county, um, Tigard, Aloha. This one, Clover Court, is an example of a PSH project. Um, so it's a small project for uh, folks who were formerly chronically homeless and had severe and persistent um, mental illness. Um, yeah, um, Cornelius Library, um, you might have seen there's a lot of press about this one, a great project. It was a new city library and it has um, affordable apartments for seniors above. Um, so yeah, really great project. And, uh, and then the last one is um, Bridge Meadows in Beaverton. Um, this was not a Metro Vaughn project, neither was Cornelius Library, their older projects. Um, but um, Bridge Meadows is a really cool um, example of innovation. Um, it's for um, seniors and uh, families who have adopted children from foster care. And to live in the community, 
you have to commit to doing a certain amount of hours of um, work in the community um, per month, I believe. Um, and that kind of work it, can involve things like making communal meals, um, offering childcare, homework help, um, working in community gardens, things like that. So um, it's a very different model, but we've heard from the people that live there that they love it um, and it's working really well for them. So just some examples of, of what affordable housing can look like in those, in those uh, few projects. And um, I apologize, I probably talked a little too quickly, but I wanted to get through the presentation, but um, I'll end now and um, just open it up for questions. <laughs>